Ready? <laughs> so, on Sunday I stopped at verse 13. We really focused on verse 12. Is anybody here Sunday? Or is here Sunday? Okay. Does anybody have any questions from what we were talking about on Sunday? <clears throat> Before I dive into the rest of, or at least 14 through 18. Any questions from Sunday? Everybody pretty much get that? For a lot of you, that was a review. I've talked about that before. Nobody? No thoughts or questions from Sunday? We're good? I wouldn't answer it. I was back with the kids. But you know what's up. Sure. <laughs> what are we talking about? All right. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, no, it's good. It's good. We should do this. I'll, 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 I'll get the mic. I'm going to review really quick because you weren't here either. Uh, verse 12 was, but as many received unto them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Okay? And I talked about how for the longest time we have kind of read that to believe that God changes his mind about us when we start believing. And the actual terminology in the Greek is not necessarily that God changes his mind about people, but that our kind of, the whole first 11 verses of this talks about Jesus being light. Okay? And when the light suddenly shines on the inside of a man and reveals who that man always is, it's not that God changes his mind about that man, it's that man changes his mind about who he is. Okay? There's a sudden realization that I have been a child of God all along. That salvation is really an awakening to our true identity. And if we actually went into, and I kept the message up here, the John 1 in the message version. And I still love this wording here in verse 12. <clears throat> but whoever did want him, who believed he was whom he claimed, and would do what he said, he made to be their true selves, their child of God selves. That's the actual language of verse 12. And if you look it up in the Greek, I really like it because Eugene Peterson did a good job of taking the Greek language and making it into our everyday language. So the idea of verse 12 is that God gives us this right. How many people have the word right in verse 12 there? Gave them the right. Anybody else have a different word other than right? Okay, that word, and I talked about this on Sunday, you asked about it this week, it's the word exousia, which is from the, the Greek word exousia, which means power. Okay? It's also the word that you go on later and you find it has a direct correlation to the word dunamis from uh, Acts, where the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Okay, those two words are related one to another. And the idea of right, he gives us the right to become children of God. When we read it in the English language that way, it's almost like suddenly, now you can come into the house. Okay, you have the right to enter now. Okay, it's not really a good word. And I, I'm not sure if there's a good English word that translates this better for us. So I was talking about how the word actually means sense of privilege. It's the idea, the word exousia, the word right means, it's like this, oh my gosh, I actually have the ticket to get in. I've had it all along. I just didn't know I had it. And it's, it even goes on to talk about how it's like the supernatural what was it? I, I gotta look it up for you because I, I need you guys to see it. If you didn't listen to the message or uh, listen to the podcast, it's really important for you guys to see this. What the word exousia means. All right, in verse twelve. This is all review still. I really want to get to some other stuff here, but I need you guys to see what this word right means. I have a really cool Bible program here called PC Study Bible that gives us. Each word in the original language, Old Testament Hebrew or New Testament Greek. And the word exousian is the sense of ability, privilege, force, capacity, competency, listen to this, superhuman potential made a reality. How do you spell that? How do you spell that word? E X O U S I A. Okay? Now, the actual word here has an N on the end of it, the Greek word with the letter N, but I read the, the definition of exousia. Okay? So it's the idea that we have all along been this person that we're not living like. Okay? You know, 
It's the classic story, like a uh, Man of Steel movie, where he's walking around trying to be normal. I mean, there's probably even a, a sense about him that he doesn't even know he is different until all of a sudden one day, and I haven't seen the movie yet. I remember the 1980s version of Superman with Christopher Reeve. <laughs> Supposedly Man of Steel is a little better. I haven't seen it yet, so I don't know. Okay, but I'm it, just thinking birds are like the chickens and the eagle and the eaglet that's walking around the chicken. Yeah, he thinks it's a chicken. Chicken. Absolutely. Not realizing he was meant to soar. It's that simple of an analogy. And all of a sudden, one day, someone walks up to him and says, you're an eagle. And the first time someone tells you that, you're probably like, whatever, look. I got all chickens around me. And look at these wings. They, 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 they pretty much look like there's over time, then the light shines. And that's when all of a sudden the realization occurs. I'm not, a, I'm not this person. I'm not a sinner. I'm not just this average. I'm royalty. And I've been living like a pauper all this time. I've been thinking that my sin and this stuff that I've been settling for is who I am. And the light comes on. That's why Jesus is called the light, John 1. Because the light comes in, and this light is actually the life of men. It's actually on the inside of every one of us. And when the light who is Jesus encounters the light in us, there's an awakening that takes place. And then a whole new way of life begins. I was talking with Courtney this week again. I was reiterating to her that really this Christian life is more about forgetting things and unlearning things that we thought were right mm -hmm. and allowing our spirit to now bubble up what, they, what it always knew. Do you know that your spirit knows who you are? Mm -hmm. Your spirit knows exactly where you came from. It remembers the imagination that the Lord was thinking when He created you. And when we start to take off all of those grave clothes that we were talking about on Sunday, then the real Janus shows up. And this whole life is about just more and more of the grave clothes coming off. Hey, big boy. How are you? Are. Welcome. <laughs> That's what <clears throat> verse 12 is all about. He gives us the right. He gives <clears throat> us the awakening. The, oh, this is who I am. And that's why the later on in life you find that the statistics drop off about people getting saved. Because it's harder and harder and harder for these people to have all of these layers removed to see who they really are. When they're young, it's easier. They're more moldable. They're more shapeable. In fact, I believe this. It gives them less time to layer on stuff. For the world to layer on. Yeah, absolutely. One way or the other. So, anyway, that's what 12 is about. That's what I talked about on Sunday. And then verse 13, pretty cool verse 2, he says, look, who were born, listen to this. He wants everyone to know that before you were ever born of blood, before you were ever born of flesh, before you were ever born of the will of man, you were born of God. Okay? Most people are just thinking to themselves when they read this, and I used to think this way too, that verse 13 was, he's not just talking about anybody, he's only talking about born againers. Mm -hmm. That's not what it reads. It reads, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. He wants every human being to know that before mom and dad thought about having a baby, before they got together, wherever they got together, God thought about you. You were first born of him. And that's why abortion is so awful. Because God thought about that child. You with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, that's what we talked about up until 13. Now we're into 14. <clears throat> now we're going to start focusing back on Jesus. So we're going to spend the rest of our time tonight just talking about the Lord. And I have a, uh, a thought I want to get to here in verse 18. But let's, let's be... What I'm going to do tonight is teach expository. Has anybody ever heard that word before? Mm -hmm. Expository teaching or preaching? Yeah. Which... Go ahead. I might ask you to take an idea and then, and then bring it through the Word. Or, or, is it, or is it the other way around? It's the other way around. <clears throat> Expository preaching is actually going verse by verse through the scripture and then explaining it okay. scripture by scripture, verse by verse. There's another way, it's, it, there's a lot of terms for it, I call it thematic, where you've got an idea and then you go and you find scripture to support your idea. Not necessarily a very sound way of preaching. Expository preaching is much more foundational, much more, you're going to have much more of a foundational principles in place when you do expository preaching. So, verse 14. Let's dig in. And the Word became flesh. Now, let's go back 
We talked about this on Sunday too. You guys are going to get tired of hearing me say this, but it's going to take generations to break this mentality. That the Word is Jesus. <clears throat> it's really important. I want to keep reiterating this because we still believe, open up the Word of God too, and then you want to turn to a page. Go to church. Yeah, at the church, you know, you, you open up your Bible, which is the Word of God. People tell you, you know, don't do that. I did that one time, and I actually, two people left the church because I did that. Wow. Because you put your Bible on the ground? Yeah, because I threw it on the ground. I said, that's not the Word of God. I was trying to be overly, and I, I will admit, I, I haven't done that since because it's probably a little immature. <laughs> I'll be the first to admit it. Because I have no desire to devalue this. But I have every desire to exalt Christ. Same with the sin, guys. I mean, yes, I am trying to devalue sin. In the name of exalting Christ. I want to exalt Christ over this. He is the Word. Okay? And so... Verse 14 here begins to begin begins to explain back what verse 1 and verse 2 were talking about. And that was, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. We know that they're talking about Jesus here. He's trying to convince Jewish readers and listeners that Jesus is God. Okay? And the Word, verse 14, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father. A couple really key things here when you look at this. First of all, this the Bible can't become flesh. Jesus becomes flesh. Okay? So God becomes flesh. The word. That word, if you look up in the Greek, let's just do this real quick so you guys understand. I want you to see what the word word is in the Greek. Now, how many people have done enough, have been in like the charismatic movement enough to know that there's two main Greek words for word in the New Testament? Rhema and logos. Okay? What have you always been taught about those two words? Those of you that had that teaching. Rhema is spoken. Logos is written. Okay? Guess what word's being used here to describe Jesus? Logos. I would have said that too. I don't know what that So it would just make sense to you that if rhema is the spoken, and there are words where if you go to the word word in the New Testament, you will see rhema because someone is speaking. It's, a, it's an expository thing. And then other times, logos, which means written. But in this case, the writer is very specific and applies the word logos, which is everywhere else written, written word of God, and applies it to Jesus. Which so all, the written word became flesh. flesh. Okay? It's in Jesus now. that if, like, That's why Jesus says, I did not come to abolish the law. What did he come to do? Fulfill it. How did he fulfill it? In himself. Now, everything that used to be written, law, code, all the things we've talked about, now is embodied, swallowed up in the person, Jesus. The problem is most of us still try to read our Bibles to find how to get better. Find rules to live by. This roadmap for life. Come on, I've heard it. Okay? If you want, you, you can probably live a pretty decent life, but that's not the goal of this book. The goal of this book is to reveal the Word. Who is Jesus? Okay? So, verse 14 talks about this. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw glory. Guess what, guys? Flesh ain't bad. This flesh. Now, there is a flesh carnal side of us that is. But look at this. The Word becomes flesh, and it says that, the writer John says here, we saw the glory of God through the flesh man. This is something I get a lot of hope in. I realize that I don't have to crucify this literal flesh. In other words, there can actually be a time in my life where I become so filled with the Word who is... Jesus. It's important for us to know this. Not filled with this Word, filled with this Word through this book that I can actually reveal the glory of God in the flesh. I don't have to die and go to heaven one day. 
The whole goal is for me to reveal the glory of God in the flesh, just like Jesus did. Glory is found in the flesh. That's why Colossians says that Christ in us is the hope of glory. Not someday when we go to heaven. Christ in us here. Christ in us now. And you know what? Every hard situation we go through, every trial and tribulation, every struggle is to take off more of those grave clothes we've talked about. More of that stuff that hides the glory. I'm sorry. Yeah. There back to what you were talking about earlier. I keep thinking of the verse by word I put in my heart that I might not sin against you. And if you take the word word and replace it with Jesus for the idea that I have hidden Christ Come on. in my heart. Shepherd's word, did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> sin against you, then it's all about that you have the spirit inside of you, yep. and it's because of that presence that you don't sin. It's not because you know scripture and you know the Ten Commandments and you know the whole book of yeah. the five books of Moses that you're obeying yeah. all of those Levitical laws, but it's be the Christ in you that's like, I'm not going to do that anymore because this is who I am. Yep. This is who I have. <coughs> I know. That is very good. So when we hide his word, which is Jesus in our hearts, then we begin to overcome sin. Powerful. So, as we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. Again, I, wanted, I, I like jumping between the message and this. The message has really been very inspirational to me lately. I want you to see this. Um, Verse 14 says this, The Word became flesh, this is the message version, and blood, and moved into the neighborhood. <laughs> and we saw the glory with our own eyes. The one of a kind glory. Like Father, like Son. Isn't that awesome? Generous inside and out, true from start to finish. This is the rest of the verse. The only begotten Son from the Father, full of grace and and truth. You see, eventually we have to realize that there really is only one sun in the earth. Okay? And that sun is Jesus. Okay? Now, I know that we call ourselves sons and daughters or children of God, right? right. That's why I call myself that. I actually don't call myself a Christian anymore. Because God never called us Christians. The world called them Christians as a mocking term back in Acts. That was never the idea. The idea was never to be called a Christian, a little Christ. The idea was to be a child of God. So I call myself that. I call myself a son of God or a child of God. But you have to realize there's only one son in all the earth, and it's Jesus. But we, someone turn to Ephesians 1 for me quickly. Verse, I think it's either 20 or 21. Okay? You got it? Yep. Go ahead. Which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. What verse was that? 20 and 21. Okay, keep going. Sorry. And he put all things in subjugation under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. Head, body, Read the last phrase. The last phrase is the most important. What's it say? Make sure that the camera can hear it. Uh, verse 23. Sorry, 23. Excuse me. Which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So what are we? His body. We're his body. And what is the body? The church. Keep, what's it say? What's the scripture say? The fullness of him. Fullness of him. Oh my goodness. Jesus is no longer full without <clears throat> us. There's only one son of the earth. His name is Jesus, and we are part of Jesus. The church does not like talking about this, because now we start to say what? We're God. Yeah. Okay? We know we're not God, because we couldn't be God. If we're God, then now we're new angels. <laughs> but can I tell you, that's what Scripture says. We are the fullness of Him. Would you say that this is not Ariana? This part. No. Of course not. 
It's part of her body. Who is Ariana? Ariana. Is this Ariana? No. Well, oh. It's a part of her. It's a part of her. But it's not the fullness of her. <gasps> that means the head is not the fullness anymore either. You just said it. I did. So you're the heretic now. That's for me. Okay, the setup. <laughs> yeah, setup. <laughs> Do you guys see this? The head is part of Jesus. The body is the finish. He is no longer full anymore without us. Now, jump to Ephesians 5. Matt, since you're the Ephesians reader. Get to the part where it starts talking about, uh, what is it, about 24, 25, where this is mystery is great. What is that, 20? 22. 22. Go ahead. Start reading at 22. About oh, no, go farther. I think it is like 24, 25, isn't it? <laughs> no, that's still about wise and public. 24, therefore, just as the church is subject to one another. No, keep going. 25, 26, where is it? That he may sanctify and cleanse her. Keep from, going. Present her to him. Keep going. 32. Okay, sorry. I'm into the whole wives this, submit to their husbands <laughs> thing, so. <laughs> this mystery is great, but I am speaking with ah. reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual. Go up. Go up a verse. Uh, for this reason, a man shall leave okay. his father and Okay, listen, listen, listen. This is so important, guys. Man. Okay, here's father, right? He went 30 for the members of his body. I don't want 30. Maybe you want 30. <laughs> At one point in time, father and son are one, according to this scripture, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then what happens? A man leaves his father. Keep going. And mother and shall be joined to his <clears throat> wife. Joined to his wife. And I cannot. <laughs> you shall be. Okay, so the two become one flesh. So now we've got a man-wife. That's, 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 that's marriage. This is exactly what marriage is supposed to be. You can't tell man from wife, wife from man. Now, what does it just say? Read that last part again. And the two shall become one flesh. Okay, the man and the wife become one flesh. Now go. This mystery is great. Mystery is great. But I am speaking with reference to Christ. Christ. And the church. And his church. <laughs> Turn to read the Bible, darn it. <laughs> Turn to read the Word of God. So, I say, so say it again. <laughs> <laughs> Before you do it, say it again. I just need you guys to see this. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. So this man-wife, what, what do we all say about that? Uh, what God has put together, Amen. let no man put asunder or separate, right? The two become one flesh. 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 This is not, Paul is not, we use this in weddings all the time, Paul's not talking about you two Penningtons. He's using you two as a symbol of what's really going on between Jesus and all of humanity. His so, bride. So whenever you talk about the body of Christ, each of us have a different job in the body, right? Yeah. We can't all be hands, and we can't no. all be feet, and we can't all be the head. Absolutely. So we all have None a spiritual, so we all have a spiritual gift that Christ puts in us in order to make the body operate properly, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's more of a function discussion. I'm still working on identity. Okay? okay? Because this, this, you guys think that you get this, but the reality and the ramifications of this simple identity crisis, which the church has, the church has an identity crisis. The whole reason why we went to the scripture is because I was talking about Ephesians 1, where the flesh and Jesus Oh, well, sorry. When the head and the body, these are not separate beings. What's wrong with Ariana? The head and the body are one. One. They're one. And so he speaks with reference to Christ and his church, where earlier on in the same book to the same people, he says, Jesus is the head, we are his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. How does Jesus fill all in all? through us. Now he sits at the right hand of God the Father and we finish him, literally. Just like my wife finishes me, just like I finish my wife, God no longer, this is the beauty of this, look at this, God leaves, sorry, yeah, God, God the Son leaves the Father, joins his wife, and now we've got this man-wife seated where? 
at the right hand of God the Father. What's the Bible say about us? Where are we seated? The right hand of the Father. In heavenly places with Christ Jesus. This is the real deal. This is who we are. You might be sitting in a broken chair in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, but the reality is you're really at the right hand of God the Father with, with, with Jesus. Right now. Right now. That's why, in my opinion, this is my opinion based upon scripture that I've read, heaven is not a far off place. Heaven is a dimension around the other side of this dimension. That's, that's, that's how it is. Because your spirit isn't disconnected from you, Randy. And up in this heavenly place, and you're down here. How can that be? No, your spirit's here. And it emanates from you. So that means that the right hand of God the Father is among us. That means Jesus is among us. That means Father is among us. That means heaven and earth are one. The light's coming on. Mm. The reality of what it's really supposed to be about. Heaven and earth separate? No. That's why Jesus prayed. Hey, you guys want to pray? Remember his disciples said, teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven. Okay? That kingdom come, uh -huh. that will be done. On Where? earth as it is in heaven. On earth! That's the goal of heaven. We have for so long believed as a church that the goal of earth is heaven. No, all of heaven is like, I can't wait to get there. I can't wait to be a part of earth. I can't wait to join in all of the stuff that's going on. Will someone awaken and bring us and, and, and release us into this earthly dimension? So, when people die, if this is, her, if this is heaven on earth, mm -hmm. where does their spirit go? Here? It's still yeah, here. I think, I think they're on the other side in this other dimension. Okay? Um, like on the spirit realm side? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's why it says that we are surrounded by such a... Who are they? It's us. It's us and us guys who have gone on before us. Now, and it says, what, what do witnesses do at a football game? Cheer. They cheer. What do witnesses do at a court ruling? Or in a court case? Testify. What do you think they're doing? They're cheering. They're testifying. They're saying, hey, 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 hey angels, get over there and help Randy out. He, he, he's going to do this here. He's going to help, help Becky out. She's going to go to this over here. They're like, you can do this! I fully believe that's what's going on right on the other side of this. That's cool. Anyway, that is cool. It is really, really cool. I can't find any racer. Yeah, Einstein had the, the thought that there were two worlds going on at the same time. We just couldn't break through the veil. Mm -hmm. He was trying to design a machine that would open the veil up so you could see the spirit world. Well, it's like the guy that was... That machine was created 2,000 years ago. In Jesus. Yep. Yep. Wow, that's a really bad eraser. <laughs> and it's like the guy that was here that invented the... Yeah, Synthesizer? Uh-huh. And I can't remember his name, though. It starts with a K. Uh, Vancouver. Yeah. Him. He was talking about the physics and he was talking about the study of your ions, your positive, your photons and electrons, and how when you study the electrons, they're constantly flipping in and out. Where, like, one minute you can see it and the next minute you can't see it, the next second you can't see it. And he was basically saying he interpreted that as. Spirit or our body flipping between spirit and natural, natural and supernatural. I remember him talking about that. Yeah, <clears throat> it's just happening so fast we can't see it. Um, he's actually he says he's not that far away from he's he's the inventor of the synthesizer. He was here and spoke at our church, and very spiritual man. And he's working on I, I have no idea. This science is like way beyond. Basically. <clears throat> he's actually creating a recorder that can record the sounds of heaven. I have no idea. I don't even know if that's real. Huh? Like <laughs> no, this is, there's a guy there. See that this hold on. This is my fear when I talk this way. Okay? And I do have a I have a real fear when I talk like I'm talking right now, where I talk about heavens here on earth. Is that I feel like because we've only ever had these kind of discussions with New Age and with occult activities and with demonic stuff, that we automatically associate spirit activity on the earth with demonic. 
and with evil things and with new age. And actually, guys, you know what? They're tapping into something that we should be tapping into. It's real. They're just using the wrong conduit. I was just listening to Greg Cook on the way here, and he said, when there is a <coughs> negative present, there's a positive present. There is the opposite present. But we get so focused on the negative that we fail to see the positive. Yeah. Yeah. The whole point of what I was coming back to is in John 1, 14. The word Jesus became flesh, human. Right? This is the only man so far that's walked the earth that was fully human and fully God. He laid down his divinity, though. He laid down. He laid it down. According to Philippians 2, we can read it later. We can look at that. This was the first guy that was able to reveal heavenly glory in the flesh. But other people have touched it. Other people manifested for a moment. This guy was able to walk in it as a lifestyle. Okay? Powerful. And he did it not in his Son of God, I'm better than you state. He did it in his human, I want you to walk here too state. Okay? Let's keep going. Full of grace and truth. The word grace is the word charisma or charismata. Okay? That word means the divine enablement of the Lord in humanity. Okay? That's what the word charismata means. Or charisma. Charisma. You can look it up. Okay? So it does not mean what you don't deserve. I hate that definition. If anybody ever tells you that grace is what you don't deserve. Can we smack them? No. <laughs> Give them what they do deserve? No. <laughs> Just tell them it's not biblical. It's not accurate. Charisma, charismata, <laughs> grace is all that is God's in humanity. Given freely to humanity. Not earned by Amanda. But simply say, you know what? I love my kids this much that what they can't do, I'm going to give them. Mm -hmm. It's not what they don't deserve. It's what they can't get to. Do you think that's what they mean by don't deserve? Like, haven't earned? Yeah, like, possible. if you earned payment? Like, yeah, if I, that's what I was talking about. But see, I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't agree humans didn't earn. It. I believe it's what they always meant to have. Right, but that's what they're saying. Like... So, if, look, here's the deal. You know, this is the classic story. I've told this many times before. If Diane is this royal kid who gets kidnapped at the age of six months, has no idea what her parents look like, because at six months you don't know what your kid parents look like, and then at 18 your dad finds you. You're not getting what you don't deserve by coming back into the palace. You're getting what you were always meant to have. Did you earn it? No. But it was always yours. You don't earn what was always yours. Because you're always a child of. It's in your bloodline. That's where I disagree with grace is undeserved. Grace is what you were always meant to walk in. You were always meant to have the divine enablement. You were always meant to have the life of God on the inside of you. The problem is the darkness overwhelmed the light on the inside of you. Grace came to make the light revealed. You with me so far? So yes, it's unearned. But yes, it was always yours. That's where I differ. You with me? Go ahead, Ariel. In some ways, it's our inheritance. It is our inheritance. It is absolutely our inheritance. We become joint heirs with Christ. An inheritance is nothing you earn. <sighs> That's where I get the don't earn. That's where I'm okay with it. What I don't like is that you didn't deserve it. You did, it's not yours, it but I'm going to give it to you anyway. <clears throat> not at all. Not at all. That's like telling Anderson, ah, we'll see how you behave. If you behave bad, no inheritance for you. And parents do this all the time with their kids. Sam, I just did it today. Now you make me feel like crap. <laughs> <laughs> I told my kid if he was good for three days, because their color chart of behavior, he's good, I'll take him to McDonald's. And I did. I should have never taken him to McDonald's. <laughs> he should have just been good. <laughs> You just nailed it. She and I were talking about that because when she first started dating. When you're five, you don't get it. it. <laughs> she was giving M and M's for peeing on the potty. Has any parent ever done this? Oh yeah. We Stop have. it! No. No. Do you just want him to work? 
Or do you want him to establish his identity? Because if we do this, we will give, listen to this, this is a pause and a commercial break. We're going to something else. Here's the commercial. The commercial is, if you give kids something for what they were just supposed to do because of who they are, you will create an entitlement mentality in them that they will think, in order for me to just be human, you better give me something or I'm not going to be human. Then how do you suggest they go to the bathroom? <laughs> On the toilet! <laughs> and Santa doesn't have an audio rice list? How do you suggest they be good in school? Affirmation. Love. Like I, my kids have not once gotten, Maddie, Maddie's not very happy about this, has never once gotten an allowance. Because you're just supposed to wash the dishes because you're part of this house. You make your bed because it's the right thing to do. But we got, that's how You get we A's, you know why you get A's? No, don't interrupt me, please. You get A's because you can get A's. Because you are worthy of an A. Because I know what's on the inside of you. And you should get an A because I want you to rise to your potential. Not because I'm going to give you 20 bucks for each A. No, you're not going to go score five goals in the soccer game. And if you do, I'll give you a dollar for each goal. What? Go out and do your best. Why? Because you have been given much. Okay, so now your time is, and it no sounds all well and good. How do I undo what I just did today? <laughs> you can't. You can't. So finish what you started. Start with something new. Start with the next thing. Man. But you have to understand, this, I think, personally, this is why we have a welfare mentality in our country. I think it's why so many kids that I try to employ at my restaurant act like when I ask them to do something. Do you know who ends up cleaning the toilet in my restaurant? You. Me. Because every other kid I've ever asked that, I don't have to do this at home. I don't know how to clean a toilet. That's below me. I cannot tell you how many people have told me that cleaning a toilet is below them. So the owners end up cleaning the toilet? And if they do do it, you should see the job they do. It's awful. So I remember hearing a message from you a while back where you would take one of the daughters and you would go alongside the daughter mm -hmm. and clean the room with her to teach her Absolutely. how to clean a room. So maybe that's what you need to do with the employee is huh? clean the toilet. There's not enough room her. in that stall for me and that chick who thinks she's too yeah, big. Have stall, yeah, I do have one. Yeah, you're right. Training that's where I'll stall. do my training. Training yeah. stall! <laughs> <laughs> But no, seriously, to your question, start with a new thing. Okay. Finish what you started with everything, but start new. Okay? Well, maybe you'll forget by next week, because I only did yeah. it right now. <laughs> and that's why we think, gosh, I, I see this all connecting like a spider web. It's the reason why when people don't do a bunch of stuff that they should do, and they don't get the reward, they think they're really bad. You with me? Because we've developed a performance mentality. Performance mentality. So if I don't do well, everybody doesn't like me. If I do do well, everybody will like me, and I will get paid well. You know what? Sometimes you just need to do well because it's the right thing to do. Because it's human to do your best. It's the way God created you. Oh, hey, if you're not going to give me that raise, I'm only going to do this half-assed. Really? How do you get the raise? You get the raise by doing it all the way. You do it by beating out all the other guys on the floor. That's how you get the better job, the raise. Because why? It's in you to do it. It's in you. Okay, commercial's over. Back to this. <laughs> Verse 15. Oh, by the way, he was full of grace and truth. Okay? We find out later that Jesus is both grace and truth. I am the way, the truth, the truth and, the and the life. See? I want to tell you, if you want to understand Scripture, Jesus personifies it all. Easiest way to understand this. I'll show this to you in verse 18. I love how we're going to end here. Verse 15. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I. Head, body. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about, you know, like, I think we have a tendency to think like, He's so much up there, and I'm so far down here. He's just talking about, look, the head on her butt would not look right. Okay? He has a higher rank. No, I'm being graphic on purpose. Because the head belongs at the top. 
Why? Because it's the point from which all things flow. That word head, in the Greek, if you go look at it, is kaphele. It means source. You put the source at the top so that it all flows down. Okay? So that's why he's the higher rank. He recognized, remember when John said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. He recognized the head was among the body. The mind of Christ, the mind of God was among the people of God. That's what he's talking about here. For he existed before me. Remember, jump to John 1, verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. This is amazing how John the Baptist had this revelation of Jesus when he walks in. That's the one. That's the one who was in the beginning with God. Okay? Verse 16. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. Okay, so the fullness of God was in Christ. Okay? And then John says, all of this fullness of God goes to who? Read it again. Verse 16. We have received. Us. We get it all. <clears throat> and this is the way he describes the fullness. Grace upon grace. The Greek idea there is grace squared. Mathematician. It actually means... So, uh, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9. What's grace squared? A whole heck of a lot of awesome. <laughs> As Ashley would say. I like that. So, grace, and what was grace? Anybody remember what the definition of grace is? The divine enablement of the Lord squared. Multiplied. Upon itself to... Us. That's beautiful. The whole reason why Jesus shows up on the earth was to give all of this fullness of God, all of this grace times grace to humans. He's like, these guys, back in Adam, when I talked about it, and I breathed into him, and I shaped him, and I formed him, and then I gave him a wife. This is what I wanted for him all along. I wanted to walk with him. I wanted him to have my nature, my character, my heart. And then he chose another way. Now I'm going to make sure that they have all of this because I'm going to put it in them this time. Right? That's what this is. Okay. That's 16, right? For of his fullness we have all received. By the way, that word all is the Greek word which means all. I suppose too. Which means all of humanity this is available to. This is not just available to some, to a few that get it. It's available to all of humanity. Do you know that 2,000 years ago, man was forgiven? In fact, I'm going to say it this way. Man was forgiven at the foundation of the world. Already. <clears throat> now, it's all about acceptance. It's all about identity. It's all about realizing, oh, I've been forgiven all oh, along. I'm walking in this this trap, I've been walking in this junk, I've been walking in my sin, and all along forgiveness has been offered to me. Man was redeemed 2,000 years ago on the cross. Not when you finally get it, Randy Pennington, Ariana Green. You are already redeemed. Now begin to walk in this. It's all available to you. Now. Do you guys realize that? It was finished on the cross. Please understand this. When he said it is finished, he meant it. He meant the full work of redeeming man, the full work of eradicating our sin, no longer being held against us, the veil being torn, relationship and the door between man and God, now completely won, all finished on the cross. Finished, finished, finished. Not when one man finally decides. Already happened. Done. Finished. Verse 17. For the law was given through Moses... Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Okay, this is really important. All right, Moses. I'm kind of repeating myself a little bit here, but that's what teachers do. Grace and truth. Okay. 
Now, for a, a little bit of a parallel, let's go to Hebrews 3. Okay, remember this. John, I'm going to read this one more time. I'm going to read Hebrews 3. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Okay, so now go to Hebrews 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. By the way, what's this book called that I'm reading from? So who's he writing to? Hebrews. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, so he's talking to his brethren. We're not sure if this is Paul or Apollos. No one really knows for sure who wrote Hebrews. But we know it's a Jewish writer writing to other Jews. So, brethren, listen, please consider Jesus. Think about him. Consider him. <clears throat> the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was in all his house. Keep going. For he has been counted, who, who's he? Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. So, another way to do this, house, builder. I like tying scripture together so you guys can see all this. So this is John 1, sorry, that's not right. This is Hebrews 3. We've got some more parallels that get developed here. There's a lot of parallels in the New Testament between Moses and Jesus. Verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Okay? 5. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant. For a testimony. What's a testimony? description of what you've been through or uh -huh. what you've done. Story. Story. Yep. Yeah. Testimony. Of those things which were to be spoken later. So you know what Moses was? He was a big signpost along the road that says, Something's coming! Something's coming! Like you guys ever have a sign that says 500 feet this or whatever. That's what Moses was. Moses was a huge signpost to everybody and all the earth saying, Something's coming! Was for, or for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later, but Christ was faithful as a son. Okay, this is still interesting. Whose house we are. Okay? Now, the, I, was, I, I need to show you guys this because I want you to see that in Jesus, now we are the house. Okay? Now it comes from something that was built and something we live in and something that we do to something that we are. That's why I don't like grace being what we don't deserve. Grace is who we become. That's why it's the divine enablement of God to be someone else. You guys with me? All right? Is it a little harder? Are you with me? Okay. So, Moses was a servant. He heard God say something and he did it. Jesus was a son. Which means sons have the DNA of their daddy in them. So you don't have to think about it. So Braden, for example, doesn't have to think about acting like his daddy. He just acts like his daddy. And then you guys say, oh my gosh, he got that from his dad. His dad. Have you seen it? I've said that. Now. <laughs> yeah. Did he have to learn that from his dad? Probably, yeah. Probably. Because he uh, saw his dad do it, so he mocked him. Okay, but he also was also on the inside his nature, his DNA. Poor kid. Poor kid. He has hair like him. His facial features are like him. It's like saying that those freckles, who's got freckles? I got some freckles. Yeah, they were painted on by her. That's what, that's what saying Moses is. Moses is, the, the, the pattern with Moses be, in order for Ariana to have freckles like her mom, we'd have to paint them on every day. That's what Moses was. He would hear God, and then he would go do what God said. But a son has the freckles already because he's his father's. You see the difference? 
That's what's going on here. Now instead of us learning how to be like Jesus, come on, what would Jesus do? Bracelets? Okay? <laughs> No, I'm serious. You think about this. That's a servant mentality. That's a Moses mentality. Okay, wait a minute. Someone just punched me in the face. What would Jesus do? We had this discussion the other night at the table. Was it, were you there when we were talking about this? Yeah. So my kids were all on my case because I taught Anderson this rule. I said, look, okay, this is what happens. Anderson, if someone, like, like someone punches you, I think I used pushes because this is back when he was in kindergarten. He was going to school. I said, if someone pushes you, you look at them and you say, stop it. And if, they pushes you, if he pushes you again, you look at them and you say, stop it. Okay? If he does it again, you turn around and you push him twice as hard as he pushed you so that he knows you better not do it again. Now, I will tell you right from the get-go, no teacher likes this advice. No teacher. In fact, I told this to one of his teachers. He said, you know, he will go to the office if that happens. I said, good. At least I know if he's at the office, he did what I told him to do. Amen. Thank you. Okay. You're I right. feel, I was Are you feeling good about there. that? Oh, yeah. yeah. I think it's right. I think it's perfectly right. Okay, so then what is the whole turn the other cheek thing? Yeah, that's where we're going. Okay. It's all testament. High five. <laughs> Here's, where Here's where I'm going. Because my kids ask me that very question. Oh, so Dad, what am I supposed to do? Turn the other cheek and let him hit this one? That way both are swollen? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said, I am not here to defend what Jesus said. But I hear, here's the bigger issue. The bigger issue is you can either do what you think Jesus would do in a situation. Or you get to know Jesus, spend time with him, just like I do with my wife. And my wife is very wise on certain things. And when I start hanging around certain situations, and that situation arises, I often think to myself, oh my gosh, what I'm about to say is exactly what Dawn would say. <laughs> Has anybody ever had this moment? You're, you, I can so, never say what she said. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting. <laughs> the point is, the more You're so you hang, here, here, this is so true. You'll Back to John 1. When the light and the light in you hang out, it magnifies the light on the inside of you. So the more you hang out with Jesus, the more Jesus you comes to the surface. You don't have to try to be like him. If you just read the Bible as a textbook, you will have to try to be like him. That's like the law of Moses. Okay? That's why they didn't like Jesus. Because Jesus said, I am. All the other guys said, do this. Jesus says, uh -huh. Eat my body, drink my blood, and then you'll be a part of me. What? All the teachers and five scribes and Pharisees are saying, no, 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 no. You need to follow the laws here. Make sure you tie and make sure you give us the first place at all the tables. Then you'll have blessing in your home. They still live this way today. Jesus says, just come. Because when, when you've seen me, you've, seen the, you've seen the Father. We are one. He was all about identity. So, when someone punches the cheek, immediately what we should be doing is turning them and having such compassion because we recognize that the punch comes from a hurt on the inside of them. It comes out of anger and frustration. Now, I will tell you this. Sometimes you need to fight back. But you don't fight back out of a temperamental anger. You fight back out of a willingness to engage them. And, you know, the punch in the face is an extreme example. The little more regular that you guys probably face every day is someone criticizing you. Or someone taking advantage of you. Or someone ignoring you or rejecting you. Okay? It's really not a whole lot different than a punch in the face because the same thing rises up in you and wants to retaliate. Instead of you realizing that they are saying or doing or acting in this way because of something that's going on in here. Jesus saw through the Pharisees, and he was able to address them on their heart issues. When Jesus rises up on the inside of us, when it's no longer a servant that has to go hurry up and read to see what Jesus would do, instead, after being with him, he simply responds through us. So it's no longer, okay, what would Jesus do here? John 3, 6, no, that's not that one. No, none of that. Instead, we just simply spend time with him, and then, uh, this is where I want to get to, and I'm getting there in my life slowly, Chris. I'm getting to the point where when someone criticizes me, I say, you know what, thank you. 
Because there's truth inside that criticism. And I'm going to take that and I'm going to grow from that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Do you know if you thank someone for their criticism, they will shut up. Because the whole point is to knock you down a peg and to make you feel worse about yourself. But when you actually take their criticism and grow from it, well, then they're like, oh, curve, no, i got to do something. Now I'm talking about a critic that's actually me. There's also good criticism. There's healthy criticism. Okay? But if we respond out of Christ in us, not trying, but simply spending time with Him and allowing the Christ in us to come out, that's the glory, right? Christ in us, the hope of glory. The reason why He was able to manifest the glory of His Father in the flesh is because they were one. one. That's what John says later. It wasn't because he studied really hard and passed all the tests, and that's why he got to be the one chosen to go to earth. No. We'll find out why he's the one worthy of it. Okay. Verse 18. Here we go. I've been waiting all night for this one. <clears throat> no one has seen God at any time. Now that's really interesting, because wasn't it just last week, or was it two weeks ago, that Moses and God spoke face to face? And he hit, hit him in the cleft of the rock so that he would and then uncover him just so he could see God's backside. But still, John's not afraid to say here, no one's seen God. That's interesting, which means Moses probably didn't get near the glimpse that we're about to get in Christ. This is incredible. We're getting to see the fullness of God in Christ. The only begotten Son. Let me tell you what that phrase only begotten means. I really like this. like what the message says here. No one has ever seen God, not so much as a glimpse. This one-of-a-kind God expression. That's what he says about Jesus. This one-of-a-kind God expression who exists at the very heart of the Father. Look at this. Who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. All right. I'll show you the side of the All right. So, I'm a really bad artist. So you're just going to get really fun. This is not okay. a stick man. Yeah, it's a little bit better. Is this target practice? Crime scene. <laughs> it's like a silk <laughs> <laughs> This is Father, okay? Read John 1.18 to the end. Somebody. No one has ever seen God of so much as a glimpse this one-of-a-kind God expression who exists in the very heart of the Father has made him plain as day. Nice. I like that one too. Okay, it says that Jesus is in the bosom of his Father. The message said, in the very, who exists at the very heart of the Father. Okay, so this is what they look like. We've got Papa here. I like to call him Papa. Love that Daddy. Oh, my heart melt. Did I say that? And then we have Jesus, who is also Son. He is in the heart of the Father, in the bosom of the Father, right? Okay? Now, we have to go back here to remind ourselves that we are the head. Sorry, He is the head. We are the body. We are the fullness of Him. We have the man. Life. So where are we? Right in the middle. We're right here. <clears throat> awesome. Okay. Now, let me just read this again. I want to make sure I get all my thoughts together. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has, this is the phrase that we need to get to all day. We're almost done, you honors. I promise. I know it's been a long day. He has explained it. That word right there. <clears throat> that word right there, explain, means to demonstrate, reveal, make known, Make understood. Okay? 
Ooh. All right. So, this is exactly the reason why Jesus was found worthy to come to earth. Because he was at and in the heart of the Father. And even when he came to earth, he still was. Why? Because he and the Father are one. Okay? So it doesn't say that he left it to come here. It says that he was in it, the heart of the Father, while he was here. That's what the language says. Let's read it again. <coughs> no one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God, who is. Everybody have is there? Mm -hmm. Is in the bosom of the Father. So you guys got to understand this. I want to go back to that little super spiritual thing here, the spooky stuff. Heaven and earth, one. There's not this faraway God and us here because he can't be near us because we're flesh and we're carnal. No, 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 no. Mm -mm. Jesus came to earth at the heart of his Father, while the heart of his Father. And that is why he is worthy to explain him. So, the word explain. Jesus comes, reveals himself in the flesh. The word of God becomes flesh, dwells among us, and explains him. Okay? Demonstrates him, reveals him, makes him known, makes him understood. What have we used in the past to explain God? What, like, if you want to understand God, what do you go to? If you, want to, if you want to see him demonstrated, if you want to see him revealed, if you want to know him more, if you want to understand him more, where do you go? The Bible. Ah, there we go. We're coming full circle again. Okay? So we've always used the Bible to explain God. What does the Bible tell us has explained him? Jesus. Jesus has explained him. So I've, I've used this example lots before. You've probably heard me say it at least once if you've been around for a little while. I am married to Dawn Derniak. And if there was a book about Dawn Derniak, someone wrote it, maybe it's even an autobiography that Dawn wrote, and I would say, Dawn, I need to go learn you. I'm going to go read your book. I'll see you later. <laughs> How would she feel? Like well, there might be some times where she might like to say, you know, you need to go study. Okay? You just need to go study for a while because you obviously don't get it. But you guys know that's an extreme example. If I want to get to know Dawn, I go to Dawn. I spend time with Dawn. I ask her questions. I talk to her. I find out about her. Here's our problem. We go to a book. We have replaced God with a book, and we don't even realize we've done it. I am not de-emphasizing Scripture. I want to emphasize Christ. You know why? The Bible doesn't de-emphasize itself, but the Bible exemplifies itself. Exalts Christ. Are you with me so far? This is really important for us to understand. Because, you know, we're students. We've, we've been trained for how many years to go to school? I mean, for some of us, that was the majority of our life. 13, 14, maybe even 15 years when we were in school. And then if you went to college, another four years. And then if you went to be a master's or doctor, another four or six years on top of that. That's a lot of education. And <clears throat> society has taught you, if you want to be a better person and be more qualified, study more. And so we do this. We've got, we've got guys in seminary learning to teach all of us about God. I wonder how many classes are called experiencing or encountering the Lord, where there's no textbook, and they sit in a room, and all they do is seek the face of God. I bet none. No way. Because at the seminary, you've got to learn how to dissect this book, and learn how to explain it better, and the Greek, the Hebrew, and all that. Don't get me wrong. I use the Greek and the Hebrew too. But I have a purpose in mind. It's to get to this guy. This guy explains the book to me. This guy explains him to me. And that's what this is all about. Jesus has explained him. If I want to know my Father, the only way to him is through Jesus. The only way to the Father. No one can get there except through me. You with me so far? 
Even the spirit of prophecy is what? What does Revelation say the spirit of prophecy is? No? I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The testimony of Jesus. Even prophecy is not to figure out what you're supposed to do with your life, which most people have used. I need a prophetic word because I'm really not sure what I'm supposed to be doing. Oh man, I haven't had a prophetic word in a while. I need to get a prophetic word so that I can know what the heck's going on in my life. Am I really going to be rich? Am I really going to have a life? All this kind of stuff. No! Prophecy is to find Jesus! This whole thing gets summed up in the Lord. Everything. Why you make money. Why you breathe. Why your hair is the color it is or why it's falling out. It's all to lead us to Christ. Everything. He is the beginning of all things. He holds all things together. And he's at the end. He is the Alpha and he's the Omega. This whole thing is about the Lord. This Bible is about the Lord. If you're reading it to find answers, if you're reading it to get stronger, you are missing the boat and it will disappoint you. If you're reading it to find him who's at the heart of the Father, you win. Every time. He has explained it. So if you want to see the Lord, don't try to read the Bible a bunch. Read it to find Jesus. If you want to see Jesus revealed, if you want to see the Father revealed, hang out with the Lord. Spend time with Him. Develop an actual, real relationship with Jesus. Make Him known. Spend time with the Lord. You want Him to be understood? Spend time with the Lord. Jesus will do a better job of explaining the Lord than any book, any preacher, any guy standing up in front of the whiteboard. Jesus explains the Lord. What are you thinking? I have two thoughts. Yep. One, this to me, and to, I don't know how everybody else feels, this to me is, is deeper than I've been before in terms of understanding. Um, and it took me back to, at one point we were teaching about the difference between body, soul, and spirit. And you had talked about how, you know, we read, initially we thought we were reading the Bible to explain the Lord, and I think it's the same with the depths of the truths about the Lord, I think if you try to go mind to your soul, to your spirit, it's always going to be kind of convoluted and complex, but I think if we operate spirit first and we start there and we let these things go into our spirit and we let the Lord just yep. root them up, I think, they, I think that's how we'll get to our bodies and our flesh. Absolutely, it works its way out. Yeah. Man and I were talking about this before this, that you know, we were talking about why, we behave, why am I behaving this way? Did you ever ask yourself, where'd that come from? Do you ever have like an action come out of you or suddenly this word comes out of you? Whoa, where'd that come from? It came out of your heart. Everything issues out of your heart. If you want to get really fixed, if you want your body to not just get healed but be healthy, fix your heart. Get your heart healed. So you're absolutely right. This starts at our heart. And guess where Jesus is? He's at the heart of his Father. That's where he goes. You're exactly right. He takes the heart of his Father and puts it on the inside of us. And then from the inside out, we begin to manifest the Lord. Okay? I want to make this very clear for the recording and for all of you. I read the Bible a lot. I love this book. I have learned more about God through it than any other way. But it wasn't the Bible that taught me. It was Christ who taught me. Because this book is a door to a living God. But so is Sherry Browning. Mm -hmm. She becomes word made flesh for me. So I can read the Bible, and then I go and I hang out with Sherry, and I get a piece of God I couldn't get there. Why? Because she's a written word. She's a logos. Okay? Because remember, the word made flesh is the logos. I hang out with Ashley, I get this, this love and affection and energy for people that I could not get hanging out with me. I couldn't, because it's the Word in her. Okay? So now everything about the Bible is to discover the Lord. The Word made flesh. But the best way, the overall best way, is to read the Bible to see Him who explains Daddy. The, the message says it this way. This one-of-a-kind expression, Jesus, who exists at the very heart of the Father, has made Him plain as day. I want God made plain as day. I want Him in my life plain as day. How do I do that? I dwell here with Him. I'm in Jesus because He's the head, I'm the body. That means I'm in the heart of the Father too. 
That's what this whole thing's about. Was that your only your first thought? Did you have well, two? My one's off top is retreating some, so I wanted to. I don't want to change that. Okay. Any other thoughts here? Or on the front screen page? Yeah. When I look at my own personal devotion time and like going back to church and the way we were raised and you know like the trying to read through the Bible in a year or the idea that you have to sit down and read a chapter or read a bunch of scripture that was kind of how I used to think and I noticed lately it's more of reading identity scripture reading whether it's a verse or it's a specific chapter over and over again every day and then sitting there and talking with the father and digging it deeper of having him reveal what that means is, to, you know, the part, I'm stuck in Isaiah 55, where it says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, my ways are higher than your ways. And, you know, just meditating on that for a couple of weeks to really dig in. What did you learn about that? Everybody turn to Isaiah 55. Then we're going to be done. I want to show you guys. I was going to ask you, when, right in the middle of you talking. I was going to ask somebody, where were you today, or where were you recently in Scripture? Let's go there and let's find Jesus. So let's go there. Isaiah 55. Uh, verse 6. I did this a couple weeks ago. Those of you that are here, we talked about this, but I think it's really good to do it again. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way. And the unrighteous man is what? Remember that. And let him return to the Lord. And he will have compassion on him. To our God. For he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not... Your who's thoughts. your? Us. Us. What's the context here, guys? Remember I told you not to forget something? What did I tell you not to forget up in verse 7? His thoughts. Who's his thoughts? I know what This isn't talking about you, Jesus. This is talking about the unrighteous man. That's why he's telling him, verse 6, Seek the Lord, you unrighteous, wicked man. But you already do. For my thoughts are not the unrighteous, wicked man's thoughts, nor are, my, nor are the unrighteous, wicked man's ways my ways, declares the Lord. Here's what happens. We read this and we automatically assume you is me. We automatically assume that the us is us. When the reality is, he's calling on the one that doesn't think like the Lord, that doesn't seek the Lord to seek him because his thoughts aren't his thoughts. And his ways aren't God's ways. But we are here. We have been seeking the heart of the Father. We are. This is what I say to you. I say all the time, we go back to a Moses mentality when we read that scripture. And we think, oh God, I have to come back here and I have to wait for God to speak to me before I can do anything because my thoughts aren't His thoughts. And my ways... Now, are there times where your thoughts aren't God's thoughts? Sure. Are there times where your ways aren't God's ways? Absolutely. But the point is, we are seeking the Lord. And we have convinced ourselves that that scripture is about us, so we have to doubt everything on the inside of us. So, basically what I get from that is, is talk about the grace of God and, you know, the, the man who, who is a sinner and how, you know, he will abundantly pardon you. He will always forgive That's you. That's all Isaiah 55 is about. So he's, so what, he's not talking about any of us. He's not talking about any of us. That's like me talking to someone who's the first time in my house, has no idea who Mark and Don are or our ways, and we're trying to teach them our ways. Look, you don't know anything about my house. You walk in here, and you just throw stuff around, and you don't pick up after yourself, and you swear. I don't think you don't know our ways and thoughts. We're going to teach you. But my daughter, she knows. Does she every once in a while kind of step out of line? Sure. But for the most part, she knows. So if you go on to 11, it says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. I want to, what I 
how I'm reading that is because this whole year has been what are you thinking and what are you speaking? That the power of life and death is in the tongue. So I'm saying the power of our word is the same. Work. However, we speak out our word, it is not going to return for it. It's going to go do that. Because we are just like the Father. We create by speaking. So when we send a word out, it's not going to return to it. It's going to go right. accomplish that. Yep. But that's just con continuing the forgiveness thought, mm -hmm. right? It's saying that I'll always forgive you, you know, no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. If you seek me and turn to me, my word isn't void. I didn't just say it to be saying it. I'll always love you. I'll always forgive you, but no matter what. But put it in the what. context of what comes out of your mouth will not return void to you. So what you say to your wife, what well, you say to your coworkers, what you okay. say to your children. Janice, you're right, but he's reading from the context of Isaiah 55. You're trying to paint it into a current context. He's trying to read it directly from the context of Isaiah 55. You're both saying accurate things. He's tying it to the context of the scripture. You're trying to tie it to the context of your life. So you're both saying the same thing from two different contexts. You good? Yeah. But it's good. I don't think it fits like my life because I'm not God and you know my words aren't the same as God's. What I'm saying life. is her thoughts and what she's saying about her words go forth and guess what? They return to her in the same way she sowed them. Is that what you're talking about? Absolutely. So is God. I am going to sow this into you and I'm believing that what I sow into you I will get back in my life. Just like if I bless my children and give them good things, I will get honor and I will get love and I will get the things that I'm really looking for in return. That's what he's talking about Isaiah 55. Like I, I could read this and I could beat myself up mm -hmm. because I could think, oh man, I, I said something to Mark that I shouldn't have said. And you know, I've, now I feel, I, I promised my kid that I'd go to McDonald's because he did good. And, now I'm feeling horrible because, you know, you know it, we, we can read it and we now can take it literal and we, we apply it to our lives. I do beat myself up whenever <clears throat> I read the Bible. Sometimes I don't even read the Bible because it makes me feel like crap. Yeah. That's because you are reading it. This, guys, what you just heard her say is why I teach what I just taught. Because this book, without the Word of God, will do that to you. Yeah. Law. Huh? Like, I've lived it's all, law. Lives all of my life like that. Yeah. Like, I constantly tell him, and he'll tell you this. Wait. Go ahead. Why did okay. you read the Bible? You should be reading the Bible more. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. So just understand, this is why. Because it has been... Because this, we live in 2013, and we still read this beautiful book like it's Old Testament law. And the whole point of this, the whole point of the Old Testament law was to bring us to Jesus. Christ. Paul talks about that. The law was a tutor that smacked our fingers and made us feel the way you do right now, until all of a sudden we're like, oh! there's a living person on the other side of this law. And now I have relationship with him. And, the, and now when I read this, that's why I wanted you to read Isaiah 55 with me. Because I wanted you to see, everybody, your thoughts are his thoughts. Your ways are his ways. Quit beating yourself up and trying to convince yourself that you're awful. When you really, you know what, God's been working on the inside of Ashley for the last how many years? Trust what he's done on the inside of you. Go for it. Your thought, he's willing to launch out with you into that. And even if it doesn't look good on the outside, you're learning so much about him as you go through it. Even if it doesn't come out perfect. Even if it doesn't come out well. Even if you don't win. Go. This illustrates your translation point perfectly. And the reason why in, in seminary and stuff like that, they're made to learn Hebrew, Greek, and, and the English translations. is because a translation is just that. It's a translation from the original. You know what I mean? And uh, so, for example, Isaiah 55, 8 through 11, reads completely differently in the message. Like, read it in the message one time, and it doesn't sound condemning at all. Yeah. I want to tell you, Becky, I totally get it. How you're feeling, I get it. And I tell you what, I get beat up all the time about this teaching I did tonight. That's why I recorded it. Because I wanted people to hear that this is about Christ, not about devaluing the Word. It's about revaluing and putting Christ in His proper, proper place and the Bible in His proper place. Okay? 
Because if Christ is the reason, I can go to any scripture in that Bible, and if my goal is to find Christ, I won't feel condemned at the end of reading it. Because I'm looking for the word in the Bible. There will always be life. I can read numbers. And because I'm seeking Christ, I'll get life from it. I can, I can read Lamentations. Gosh. <laughs> That's a hard book to read sometimes because he's just lamenting about how sinful the Israelite people are. But if you look at it through the eyes of Christ, you don't walk away with this, man, I suck. You walk away with, wow, life without Christ, I could be like that. Life without relationship, living relationship, I could really be down in the dumps, just like he's lamenting about the Israelites. Completely different context. You can read Job and see how Job was trying so hard to not listen to all his friends and even his wife saying, curse God and die. You can find Christ right in the middle of that. I want this book to be something you read every day. But so many people feel the way she just described. So thankful that you did that. Mm -hmm. Because we don't read it because we're like, oh, it's just another thing I can't measure up to. Mm -hmm. No, nope, there's something else. I read the Beatitudes today. <laughs> Blessed are the peacemakers. I just ripped Randy a new one before he left for work. <laughs> that, was only, that was for like nine months, wasn't you? <laughs> <laughs> she was horrible. But see, look, here, let me just give you that really quick. Blessed are the peacemakers. Do you know sometimes it takes war to make peace? It doesn't say blessed are the peace keepers. It says peacemakers. And Don and I have made some peace. We have warred. You can't have peace without conflict. You can't have peace unless there was something that was stirred up and dealt with and so sometimes peacemakers are like, you know what? I am tired of that lump under the carpet. We're dealing with this today. Blessed are you who took the carpet off the, the lump of dirt. Oh, gosh. Peacekeepers come after the peacemakers. Yeah, they really do. Peacemakers are like, you know what? Let's deal with this. Let's go. All right. You ready? I'm ready. You know, like, I still love you. Bam. You are really cute. Bam. And at the end of this, you do that. Blessed are the peacemakers. What's it say afterwards? Blessed are the peacemakers. What is the promise of the Beatitudes? Blessed are the peacemakers. I think you have to have the right mindset. They inherit Oh, you're absolutely right. Yeah. If you're just conflicting to be a jerk or to be a whiner. I could go right or to be now a... and talk to my dad about an issue that I have with him. If I'm not in the right mindset to be able to not get defensive when he says things to me, right. like I couldn't, like it, it has to be the perfect timing. Mm -hmm. It can't be. Yeah, so you know that. Does. You know that. And if you don't go on the right timing, you just end up being a fighter, not a peacemaker. You've got to know the right time. You've got to know the right attitude. You have the right setting for him. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Mm -hmm. That's what it says. So I, Make it everything, please, if there's anything you got out of tonight, is that this, this became this, and because he became flesh, flesh can reveal God's glory. We are one with him. We are the fullness of God in Christ. We are a son, not a servant. We have a better promise than Moses ever gave us. And then we discover that we, don't, we find out who the Father is and who God is because we know Jesus. We relate to him. If there's anything I would want out of my life, I want to be able to die and someone say at my funeral, I could, as a result of Mark's life, I wanted to know Christ. Know Him, the person of Christ. Not some scripture about Him, but I want to have living encounters with Him. I want to be able to see Him. I want to be able to hear Him in my ears. I want to be able to feel His kiss on my cheek. I want people to encounter a living God. Not some historical Okay. Any other thoughts? Every time I keep looking at that, I keep thinking about what Jana said about being a silhouette of a target. <clears throat> but we're in the center of it because we're the critical. Whoa. Wow. And. That's good. So what gets attacked? Uh-huh. Yeah. Let's we're target. the most sensitive, the weakest part. We're all, but the fragile is also the most critical, protected. 
Precious. Yeah, precious. That is really good, guys. But it took all of us to work. Yeah, that's not just Matt or just Randy or Janice. That's all of us. We are the fullness of Him. So, the reality is... <laughs> I really like it. She really likes it. Because I really like coming here. Yeah. Thank you. I love you guys. We love you. Can tell me, sorry, verse 14, John 1. What's the, what's the Greek word they're using for glory? What, what kind of glory is God? I, I know the Hebrew word is kabod. Well, I don't want to keep it on. What verse? 14. Because you talked about glory made flesh to show his glory, and I think I've had a misunderstanding of glory the whole time, because I keep thinking glory means that light is coming out of it. Mm -hmm. All right. It's uh, the word doxa, or doxa, D-O-X-A-N. Um, give me a second here. Every time there's I think about God's glory, I just think it means like the emission of light. <laughs> Something's got to be glowing. D-O-X-A? Huh? D-O-X-O. D-O-X-O. To glorify, I think, like to make something stand out. It's a long term of the primary word, doko. Uh, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld glory. Wow, the original Greek word means to think. Or to seem. In other words, to appear, to to uh, make manifest the thoughts of. Okay. Okay. So the word glory, it's it's actually the the root word for doxa is dokeo, which means to think, and by implication to make or seem true or truthful. So the idea is that Jesus back it ties into the verse eighteen where he reveals his glory. In other words, it makes known what was hidden. So it magnifies. It magnifies it. It almost like it, it, what we can't see because of this, Jesus becomes flesh, and now we see what we couldn't see before. What was once a mystery, Ephesians 5, is now for the world to see. That's glory. Thank you. Wow, thanks for that study. We good?